Okay. Um, so we now have been successful in measuring the speed of light, but we want to know what determines it. Okay. Uh, so I gave a couple of examples last time, so let me just write those down. So the first example I talked about was the speed of a bullet. Okay. Um, so suppose I've got a gun. Gun looks something like this. There's a gun. Okay. That's good enough. And then this gun fires bullets, and these bullets have a certain speed. Right, so let's suppose that this gun fires bullets at 100 meters per second. Okay. Now, if I were to do an experiment where I run with the gun or drive a car with the gun, so here's me running. What do I look like when I'm running something like this? Okay. So I'm running and I'm holding the gun. Here's the gun. Okay. And again, I fire the bullet. So let's suppose in this experiment I'm, I'm running at 10 meters per second, which is pretty fast. It's about as fast as Olympic sprinters run, but anyway. So I'm running at 10 meters per second, then if I fire the bullet, the bullet will have a speed of 110 meters per second, right? relative to a stationary observer. So what this shows is that the speed of the bullet is determined relative to the gun. If the gun is stationary, the bullet has a speed of 100 meters per second. If the gun is moving with 10 meters per second, then the bullet has a speed of 110 meters per second. Okay? So in this example, can I write down here? I think I can. If I write here, can you see it? Not quite. Okay. Let me write. Okay. Because of this, yeah? Okay. Let me write it up here then. Okay. So in this example, the speed of the bullet. is determined relative to the gun. Okay. So the speed of the bullet is relative to the gun. Like if I change the speed of the gun, then that changes the speed of the bullet fired from the gun. Okay. Um, and the general term for the gun in this example, is the source. Okay? So the source of whatever I am emitting. So the gun is the source of the bullets. So that's one way in which a, a general speed can be determined. The speed of an object can be determined by the source of that object. Right? In this case, the bullet and the gun. Okay? Um, but that's not true of everything. So a second example, um, is the speed of sound. So again, I briefly mentioned this last time. Okay, so let me draw some equivalent pictures. So here's me. There's me. Okay, so I shout something. Hello. Okay. And this sound comes out of my mouth and reaches you with a certain speed, okay, which is known as the speed of sound. Speed of sound well, in the air, that's about 330 meters per second, I think. So in one second, the sound travels about 330 meters. I think. Okay. So again, we can do the same kind of experiment. I run or I drive a car and I shout and see, does that affect the speed of the sound? Okay. So, okay, I'm going to it up here. so I do the same kind of experiment. My drawing skills are not very good, you may have realized. Okay, here's me running. Like that, okay. And again, I shout hello. And again, the sound comes out. Now, this example is different, right? In this example, even if I run at a speed of 10 meters per second, the speed of sound is 
not changed, right? The speed of the sound coming out of my mouth is not affected by my speed. Okay? So the speed of sound is not determined by the speed of the source. It's different from the case of bullets, right? In this case, what's the speed of sound determined by? The air, right. So the speed of sound is determined by the air. In particular, the frame in which the air is stationary. Okay? So the air in this room is stationary, so therefore um, sound travels with an equal speed in all directions. So I used a couple of terms here which have a technical meaning, so let me just define them. The rest frame of the air means the, the frame, the observer velocity, for which the air is stationary. Okay? So the rest frame of the air in this room is just standing still. Right? It's, it's not moving. Whereas if there was a wind, if we go outside and it's a windy day and there's a wind of 20 meters per second or something that way, then the rest frame of the air is 20 meters per second in this direction, right? So rest frame just means the frame, the reference, in which the air is stationary, not moving, okay? Also, we have a more general term than this. Actually, sound doesn't only travel in air, right? Sound also travels through water. It also travels through solids, okay? It can travel through any kind of material. So the general term for this material through which sound travels is known as the medium. So in this example, the medium of the sound is the air. But the medium of sound could also be water or a solid object and so on. Okay. Right, so what I want to do now then is ask the same kind of question about light. Okay, how does light behave? So if you look at these two examples, the major difference is that the bullet is, is a particle. Right? It's, it's a kind of point object. Not definitely okay. Whereas sound is a disturbance in a medium. Right? What is sound? Sound is a oscillations of pressure in the air. Right? It's, it's a wave moving in the air. Okay. Um, so we can crudely divide these two cases as this is the behavior of particles, speed is determined by the source, and this is behavior of wave, the speed is determined by the medium. Okay. So we can ask them, what about light? Um, now, this question took a long time to be answered. Okay? As soon as the speed of light was known, people were thinking about this. Right? But experimentally, it's a very, very difficult thing to test. And what we're going to talk about today is how was it tested. Okay? Um, you know, in the case of a, a gun, you know, it, because the speed is about 100 meters per second, it's not too difficult to do that test. Okay? To, because you just measure the time it takes for the bullet to move from here, say, over there. Okay? And you just measure the time, speed is distance divided by time. Okay? But for light, the speed of light is 300 million meters per second, give or take. Okay? And this enormous speed means it's very difficult to do this experiment. right? Because suppose in the first example, if I run with a torch and see, does it change the light speed from this to this, okay, that difference is virtually impossible to measure, right? Especially with the technology that existed 300 years ago. Okay. So therefore, there was a lot of time where theorists were trying to answer this question, but without any experimental evidence. So there was therefore a lot of kind of discussion a lot of different theories were made about this. Okay, so I'm just going to describe what the main theory was. So in, in the 1700s, 1800s, 
a lot of experiments were done on light, okay? and the results of most of these experiments showed that light could be treated as a wave. Okay? Light has wave-like properties. Um, you can do refraction experiments, diffraction experiments, and so on. Okay. So, therefore, the most natural thing to think is that if light is a wave, then it should behave something like sound, which is also a wave. In other words, there should be some medium of light, so some medium through which the light moves, okay? and the speed of this medium determines the speed of the light. So this, this was the most popular theory at the time. The only problem is, with sound, we can actually detect the air, right? It's quite easy to, you know, you can feel the air move, right? But with light, we can see the light from distant stars and galaxies. And as far as we can tell, there is nothing very much in between us. Okay? So it seems like the light is traveling through empty space. It doesn't need air. It doesn't need any kind of material to travel through. Okay? So therefore, scientists invented something. Okay? So scientists at the time assumed that light was a wave. Okay, and there was some experimental evidence for that, which we're going to talk about later on in this course when we talk about quantum mechanics. Okay. So they assumed it was a wave, it was a wave in a medium called the ether. So, we can't detect this, so they just thought of a name. Okay? They literally invented it. Okay? Light seems to behave like a wave, therefore it should have some medium in which it travels. Let's call it the ether. Right? It's, it's just that simple. Okay. So this is called the ether. Some people spell it without the A, by the way. So you may see just E-T-H-E-R or A-E-T-H-E-R. I'm going to use this one. Okay. Okay. So they assumed that there was this ether throughout all of space. And the speed of light was determined by the speed of the ether. So that was the hypothesis, the most popular hypothesis um, of the time. But as I said, because the speed of light is so fast, it took a long time for this hypothesis to be tested. Like 150, 200 years until they could actually test this hypothesis. Right, so... I'm going to tell you about some of the tests of this hypothesis, but first, before we do that, I just need to do a little bit of calculation so that we can, um, so that I can quantitatively define how these experiments work. Okay, so the question I want to consider is the following. Scientist says that there's this ether that fills whole space, so I'm going to draw the ether just as some dots. There's the ether. We don't know what it is, right? So it's just blue dots. Now, if the ether is stationary, so the ether is not moving, then the speed of light should be the same in all directions. Right? So if the ether is stationary in space, then the speed of light should be C, the same speed in all directions. Right? In the same way that in this room the air is stationary, and the speed of sound is the same in all directions. So, stationary. In the stationary ether, the speed of sound is the speed of light, sorry, is the same in all directions. Now, imagine that the ether is moving. So imagine that the ether is moving this way with a certain speed which I'll call u. So this is the ether velocity. So now my little ether particles are flowing this way in space. Now in this case, the speed of light will not be the same in all directions. Right? 
when the light is flowing with the ether, it will go a little bit faster. Right? So in this case, the speed will be C plus U. Right? Just add the ether speed to the speed of light if they're going in the same direction. When they're going in the opposite direction, the speed should be C minus U. Right? So it goes faster in the direction of the ether and slower in the opposite direction. Right? Now the thing I want to calculate, which, I mean, it's not too difficult, but takes a little bit of calculation, is what's going to be the speed of light in other directions. So for example, what's going to be the speed of light if I'm going perpendicular like this? So the answer, by the way, is not C. Lots of people assume that the speed of light doesn't change in this direction. That's not true. So that's what I want to calculate now. Right, so in order to calculate this, we need something which is known as a Galilean transformation. So let me explain what does a Galilean transformation mean. Okay. So the Galilean transformation is an attempt to ask, answer the following question. Suppose I've got an observer here, okay, and this observer has some coordinates, which you can call x and t. He measures space and time. Okay, and he is trying to measure the space, position, and time of a certain event. Okay. So he's watching something, and he says this thing is occurring at position x at time t. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. So how does he measure that? Well, in order to measure the spatial position of this thing, he needs to have some apparatus to measure space. Okay. So we can give him a ruler. Right? And he can use his ruler to measure the position. Right? In order to measure the time at which something happens, he needs to have some apparatus to measure time, so we'll give him a clock as well. So this observer has a clock to measure the time of something and a ruler to measure the position of something. Okay. Now, the question we want to ask is, answer is the following. Suppose I've got another observer here who has the same setup, so he's also got a ruler. And he's also got a clock. Okay. But the second observer is moving <coughs> in this direction with a speed u. Okay. So I'll, I'll do this a okay. So two observers, but the difference between them is they one of them is moving relative to the other. Okay. Now, if this observer we call S he measures coordinates x with this ruler here and time t with his clock, then this observer, which is usually called s prime for some reason, he will measure a different position, right, because he's moving. So he will measure a position x prime and he will measure a time t prime. <coughs> okay, so let me write something about that. And the question I want to ans answer is what position and time x prime t prime is measured by the other observer s prime. So this event, it doesn't matter what it is, just something happens over there. And both observers measure the position at which it happens and the time at which it happens. So in order to answer this question, we need to make some assumptions. The first assumption we, we make is that at time zero, the clocks are synchronized. Okay? So at time zero, the clocks start at the same point. So the first thing you assume is that at t equals zero, t prime also equals zero. So this, they agree on zero. Okay? And we make the same assumption about x. 
So we assume that at x equals 0, x prime equals 0. So at this particular point, both observers agree. Which we can just set at the 0 point. So that's more or less the definition. Okay? So that's the first thing we assume. Now, we can answer the question. So the second thing we assume, and this is an assumption, which we'll talk a lot about later on, is that if the clocks start off ticking at the same time, so they agree on zero, then they keep ticking at the same time. So in other words, if the clocks are synchronized at this particular point, then they stay synchronized. Okay? So if this, if this clock, this is S's clock, this is S prime's clock, right? If this clock measures 10 seconds, then this clock also measures 10 seconds. We assume. Okay. So we assume that t equals t prime for all times. So in other words, the two observers agree upon the measurement of time. Okay. So then, the only thing we have to say, so we've said that t prime is just the same as t, the only thing we have to answer then is what's x prime? And this is also easy to answer. So at the time t, Here's the first observer, S, with his ruler. Okay. Here's my event. Okay. He measures position X here. At time T, the second observer will have moved. Right? Because the second observer here is moving in this direction. So at time zero, they start off together. At time T, he will have moved. Right? And in particular, the amount he will have moved is S prime. He's got a ruler. Okay. He is measuring coordinate X prime. How far will he have moved? He will have moved a, an amount U times T. Right? U is his velocity, T is the amount of time, so that's how far he's moved. So therefore, just by comparing the distances, this distance here is x, this distance here is u minus t, so therefore, okay, so I haven't drawn it quite right. So we should really draw it from the start of the ruler, right? This distance here is ut, this distance here is x prime, this distance here is x, right? So therefore, we can write down x prime is equal to x minus u times t. Okay? Dead easy, right? And we've already said the times stay the same. So we have these two equations that relate the coordinates of one observer to the coordinates of another, okay? when they've got a constant relative velocity between them. And it's these equations which are known as the Galilean transformation. Now, how does this Galilean transformation help us to answer this question here? Okay. So the obvious answer is that if my observer S prime sees this, sees the stationary ether, then the observer S will see that. Right? So therefore, this can be the S prime picture here, and this is the S picture. So provided we know how to relate velocities between S prime and S, then we can answer this question here. Is that clear? Maybe. Let me just say it again, because it's quite important. So imagine, this is a stationary ether, right? And imagine that this is what the S prime observer sees as he's moving. So if he sees a stationary ether, then the S observer must see the ether moving with the S prime observer. The S observer will see the ether moving like this. So we can relate the velocities by relating the measurements of these two observers. So let's do that. Okay, so what does the Galilean transformation imply for the measurement of velocities? 
So the S prime observer measures. So S prime is now watching something move, and he measures the velocity V prime. So velocity is just the derivative of position with respect to time in his coordinates. Right? That's by definition. Now we can put in the Galilean transformation here. GT, I'm going to use Galilean transformation. Right? So if you put in the results of the Galilean transformation, T prime is the same as T. So D by DT prime is the same as D by DT. Timing measurement is the same. And X prime, if we've written down there, is X minus U times T. Okay? Now, U is a constant. Right? It doesn't depend upon time. So therefore, D by DT of U times T is just u, right? So this is equal to dx by dt minus u, right? But this is just the velocity measured by the S observer. Right? So what we conclude from all this, very simply, is that the velocity measured by the S prime observer is equal to the velocity measured by the S observer minus the relative velocity between them. So that's the Galilean transformation of velocities. Okay? Right, so what does this mean for light? So if S prime observer sees a stationary ether, Okay, and I'll just look at the, the case of light going up here. So the S prime observer sees a stationary ether, let's assume. He therefore sees light moving at the speed C. Okay. Then what does the S prime observer see? Sorry, what does the S observer see? He sees the ether moving this way. Oh, Tanshi man, I need you. Sorry, that's not, I mean, it's not wrong, but that's not the question I wanted to answer. So. That's the ether. The question I wanted to answer is, suppose that the S observer sees light going vertically up, right? Then this light will have a certain speed which we can call B, and that's the thing we want to find. Okay? Now, what does the S prime observer see, right? Well, according to this formula, V prime is equal to V minus U, okay? So therefore, he will see light going in a direction like this, and we can make a triangle out of this, like this, and this, and this vector here is the vector V, which is the speed of light measured here, and this vector here is the vector minus U. So that's the result of this transformation here, right? V minus U. Okay? Now we know that in S prime frame, the ether is stationary, so therefore the light is traveling at a constant speed C. Right? Because if the ether is stationary, light is traveling at speed C. So therefore, we get a nice triangle which looks like this. This is V, this is U, and this is C. Okay? This is a right angle. So therefore, we can conclude that V is equal to Pythagoras theorem, square root of C squared minus U squared. Okay, so that answers the question, right? What speed of light do you measure in this case when the ether is moving? Well, you measure a speed, square root, C squared minus U squared. So this observer with the moving ether will measure speed C plus U parallel to the ether, C minus U anti-parallel to the ether, and then this speed 
at 90 degrees to the ether. Right. Okay, and th this result is going to be important um, for the, the experiments I want to describe to you now. So. Right, so because we've got this theory of the ether, people were very interested in doing experiments to measure this. So you want to be able to measure your speed through the ether. So in order to measure your speed through the ether, you have to be able to measure the difference in the speed of light in different directions. Okay? But as I said, this is a very, very difficult experiment to do. Right? If you think about measuring the speed in the usual way you measure speed, which is you know, to fix a distance and then see how long it takes to go from here to there, right? then that's going to be very, very difficult, right? Suppose that I fix a distance of about a kilometer, okay? And I do an experiment where I send light from this position here to this position here, right? And I measure the time it leaves and the time it arrives. So the first difficulty, there are lots of difficulties, right? The first difficulty is that this time is very short. It's just three millionths of a second. Okay? So that's the first difficulty, is actually just measuring the time accurately. Right? Measuring accurately the time at which it leaves, and measuring accurately the time at which it arrives. It's different. Right? It's so short. Secondly, the thing you're trying to measure is not the speed of light itself, but the change in the speed of light. Okay? So if the speed of light takes a few millionths of a second to go here, then the change in the speed of light will be even smaller. Right? The change in the time measurement will be you know, billionths of a second or even smaller, depending on your velocity through the ether. So that's a very short difference of time to measure. The third and final problem is that in order to do this experiment, you need to have two time measuring apparatus. Right? You need to be able to measure time here, the time at which the light starts, and you need to be able to measure time here the time at which the light arrives, right? And, again, these clocks need to be synchronized. They need to tick at exactly the same time, right? Because even if the difference between them is a few millionths of a second, it destroys your measurement, right? So all of these things are very difficult experimental problems, okay? And that's why the original experiments trying to detect this did not look like this, okay? You had to be a little bit more clever than just boom, boom, and measure the time, right. So I'm going to describe the original experiment to you, okay, after the break. Um, so in, in order to prepare, the first thing I want to do is worksheet one, question three, which is looking at this kind of problem. Okay, so suppose the Earth is moving relative to the ether, so the speed of light is not the same in all directions, and a light beam travels between two mirrors and is reflected back along its original path. So there is a picture there to help you. Let me just draw it again here. So the experiment is this. You have two mirrors. The distance between the mirrors is L, okay? And what you do is you measure the time it takes for light to move between these two mirrors here and then back away. It's very nice. Right? Now, already, you see we've solved one of the problems that I talked about. Because in order to do this experiment, you only need one clock. Right? Because you're measuring the time it leaves and the time it arrives at the same point. So that's already an improvement. By using a mirror, we can get rid of one clock. So that's a big help. Okay. And we want to know how long it takes. Okay. So, if the ether is stationary, then it's dead easy, right? If the ether is stationary, then the time it takes is simply distance divided by speed. Right? The distance is 2L, because it goes there and comes back. Speed of light is C. Right. But that's not what the question is asking you, because that's a bit boring. The question A and B are two different parts. In part A, you assume that the ether velocity is moving parallel to the light with a speed v. So that's part A of the question. Assume that the ether is moving this way. 
Okay? And part B of the question is assuming the ether is moving this way. Okay? So we're just going to calculate the time it takes for the light to go here and back in two different cases. First, when the ether is moving in that direction, parallel to the light. And second, when it's moving perpendicular to the light. Okay. So note, in particular, T1 is bigger than T2, right? So if you're moving parallel with the ether, that's a bit slower than moving this way in total time, right? T1 was going this way, T2 is going this way. So T1 is bigger than T2. Yes. It is U squared, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's right on the, on the worksheet, yeah. Okay, and then finally, let's do part D. Part D says, time, find the velocity u, as we call it here, for the total time difference to be 1% of the total time. Okay, so we want that L u squared over C cubed is 1%, 1% 1 is 0 0.01 of the total time, which is approximately 2L over C. So we want to solve this equation for, sorry, two, yeah, two L over C. We want to solve this equation for U. So this means that U squared is equal to L's cancel. So we get two, mega where am I? <laughs> 0 0.02 times C squared. So therefore U is equal to square root of 0 0.02 times c, okay, um, which is about 0 0.14 times c, which is, okay, 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Sorry, if you can't read that. I'll, it'll be up there for the break, so you can come and see it later. Okay, so what this shows is that even to measure a very small amount of time difference, like just a 1% time difference between this way and that way, you need to have a very, very large ether velocity. Right? This is more than 10% the speed of light. Okay. So that looks quite forbidding, right? This time difference, if you measure this time difference, then that, you can use it to calculate the ether velocity, right? if you can measure this time difference, you can calculate u. But because c is so big and you've got a c cubed on the bottom, this time difference is incredibly small. Right? But the amazing thing is that um, two scientists called Michelson and Morley managed to do an experiment that could measure this time difference. Okay? And it was a really incredibly clever experiment. Okay. So we'll take a break. It's a little bit late. But we'll take a break for 10 minutes and after the break, I'll tell you how Mickelson and Morley were able to measure this time difference. Right. Um, now, you can ask what kind of fringe shift should we expect, right? How big a fringe shift should we expect? And that means estimating the value of V here, estimating the ether velocity. So we don't know the ether velocity, but you can argue as follows. If you assume that the ether is approximately State, not stationary, approximately constant velocity throughout the solar system, right? then the Earth's velocity is changing. Right? Here it's going 30, meters, 30 kilometers per second this direction. Six months later, it will be going 30, 30 kilometers per second in the opposite direction. Right? So the Earth's velocity is changing through the ether. Okay? So therefore, we should be able to measure, assuming the ether doesn't move with the Earth, we should be able to measure an ether velocity of at least 30 kilometers per second at least once during a year. Right? Because suppose that the ether velocity was matching the Earth here, then over here it would be opposite the Earth. Right? So at least at one point you should be able to detect the ether velocity of at least this amount. Make sense? Okay. So therefore a, a value, a possible value for V is about this, the speed of the Earth around the Sun. Right. Um, 
So that's the Michelson-Morley experiment. It has been done many times throughout history. The first one was done in 1881, but it wasn't really accurate enough to get a, a clear answer. The next one was done by Michelson and Morley in 87. That's the famous one. Um, and then it's been repeated by different experimentalists many times since then. Okay? I'm sure there's more than this. This is just a summary I found. So if we look at this table, what have we got? So this is the experiment name. This L here, that's the length of one arm of the experiment, right? including multiple reflections. This delta calculated, d calc, this says, that's the size of the fringe shift you would expect if you take the ether velocity to be equal to the speed of the Earth, right? So if you take this value of the ether velocity, then what the fringe shift you'd expect is here, right? So in the famous experiment here, you'd expect a fringe shift of 0.4 fringes, right? Which 0.4 fringes, what does that mean? So I've got my fringes like this, dark and light, dark and light, dark and light, dark and light. Okay, so that's one fringe there. So a fringe shift of 0.4 is about this much. Right? This fringe will move to about there. Okay. So that's what you'd expect to observe. But the next column is what was actually observed within experimental error. And the important thing about the next column is it's all zero, right? Basically, they never observed a fringe shift. Nobody has ever observed a, a clear fringe shift in the Michelson-Morley experiment. Okay? So what does this mean? The, this last one is just comparing the two values in these two columns. Okay. So if you never detect a fringe shift, then that means that the ether velocity is always zero. So the clear result of the Michelson-Morley experiment is that the ether velocity is always zero throughout the Earth's orbit. Right, so the Michelson-Morley experiment, as I said, said that the ether velocity is always zero relative to the Earth. What this must mean is that the ether is going around the Sun just the same way as the Earth is going around the Sun. Right? So the Earth's velocity always matches the ether velocity. That's the only way you can explain the experiment using the ether, right? But luckily, there was already a theory of the ether, which was known as the ether drag hypothesis, or the total ether drag hypothesis, this one is. And what it said is that the ether should be dragged or pulled by matter, okay? So even if the ether is stationary in the solar system, once it gets into the Earth's atmosphere, the ether will be pulled along by the Earth. Okay? So that's drag. Drag means that, right? Drag is like this, right? That's dragging. So the ether is dragged by the Earth. Now, if this is true, then you can very easily explain the Michelson-Morley experiment, right? Because you're doing the experiment on the Earth, and on the Earth, the ether is being dragged through the Earth's atmosphere. So therefore, you never measure any difference between the ether velocity and the Earth velocity. Okay, so that's one way you can explain it. Unfortunately, there are other problems. So the ether drag hypothesis explains the null result of the Michelson-Morley experiment, but there are some other things it cannot explain. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about one of these things. Imagine that you are on Earth and you're observing a star through a telescope. Okay, so here's you on the Earth, here's a star, and you're observing the star through the telescope. You can see the star because light from the star is going into your telescope. Right? Pretty simple. Right. Now, what's the, so what happens if the Earth is moving relative to the star? Okay. So, suppose that the star is stationary in this reference frame and the Earth is moving relative to the star. Now, if I do the same thing again, there you go. We're having this problem again, aren't we? Okay, I'll use this. Okay. If we do the same experiment again, you see that something dodgy happens, right? Look at the light, the ball of light from the star. It goes in through the side of the telescope. Right? That's no good, right? Light shouldn't go in through the side of a telescope. So in fact, if you want to see this star, what you have to do is tilt the telescope, right? If you tilt the telescope, then the light goes in the front. 
But that means, even though the star is actually up here, if I want to see the star, I have to look over here. Right? So the apparent position of the star is different from the real position of the star if the Earth is moving. Right? And this effect is known as aberration. Okay? The shift in the apparent position of stars due to the motion of the Earth is known as aberration. Okay? Um, and you can actually, it's quite easy to calculate a formula for it. The angle theta here, the shift in the star's position, should be approximately equal to the Earth's velocity divided by the speed of light. So this is actually another way in which you can measure the speed of light. Okay. One way this is often explained, by the way, is if it's a rainy day, suppose it's a rainy day and the rain is coming down from the sky, right? if you are walking through the rain, then your front gets wet and your back is dry. Right? Because the rain is relative to you, the rain appears to be coming in like this. Right? So it's, it's the same effect. Right? Because the Earth is moving, although the light is really coming straight down, because the Earth is moving, it looks like it's coming at an angle. Right. So that's the effect of aberration. It's a real effect, and you can observe it experimentally. The problem is that if the ether drag hypothesis is true, then it doesn't exist. Right? Because suppose that the ether drag hypothesis is true, that means close to the Earth, or at least within the Earth's atmosphere, the ether will be dragged along with the Earth. Right? That means when light from the star, again, we're having this problem. When light from the star enters the ether, it will be dragged along in the direction of the ether. Right? So it won't go in a straight line, but once it enters the Earth's atmosphere, it will be bent along like this. Let me show you that again. So we're moving a path, something like that. And in this case, it's clear, hopefully, that you don't get aberration. Right? Because in this case, the, the motion of the Earth exactly matches the, the motion, the change in the direction of the light. Okay. So if the ether drag hypothesis was true, then we shouldn't observe this effect of aberration. But we do. Right. So that left us in, in a bit of a trouble. So we have these two experiments, the Michelson-Morley experiment and these aberration experiments. And we can't explain both of them. Okay? If we assume that the ether velocity is just a constant, doesn't change, then we can explain aberration. Right? But then we should be able to measure something in the michelson morley experiment. On the other hand, if we assume that the ether is dragged by the Earth, then we can explain the michelson morley experiment, but we cannot explain why we see the aberration effect. Okay? So, this was a problem, and it turns out to be a, a critical problem, with the ether theory. Um, and this sets the stage for special relativity. Okay. So, I can summarize then, just briefly. We started this class with the idea of the ether. Okay. The light has a certain speed. Its speed must be determined relative to something. And that thing is called the ether. Okay. So, that theory has been around for hundreds of years. Just in the 1800s, people were able to test it, okay? And when they tested the ether theory, there were lots of problems, okay? There was no single ether theory which could explain all of the experimental results. And this problem eventually led to the theory of relativity, okay? which is what I will start explaining on Thursday's class. <laughs>